Hello, I'm Dr Benjamin Miller and in this lecture I'll be providing an overview of Rite 1001 with particular reference to the final essay for the course um, in the hope of giving you some feedback uh, before the essay is due. Um, it's an overview of the course as well so that we can think about how the course has prepared you for the final essay. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure discussing issues in the study of writing and rhetoric with you all throughout the course, um, and I'm genuinely looking forward to the essays that you submit at the end of the course, um, many of which I'll end up reading and marking. Um, so this lecture sums up the course by providing an overview of some of the key rhetorical concepts that many of you will be using uh, in your final essay. Um, Further, we're going to discuss why you would conduct a rhetorical analysis, which everyone is doing in their final essay. Why would we make you perform a rhetorical analysis? And why is this uh, form of essay, this type of rhetorical analysis, wonderful for your own learning and development as a young scholar, um, as a community member, and as the wonderful human being that you're becoming? Before we get started on uh, discussion of the final essay and rhetorical analysis, I thought it's an apt moment to uh, bring to your attention the other Writing Hub units that are available for study at the university. Um, on this slide, there are four listed units, Write 1000. If you've particularly enjoyed the way um, Write 1001 has addressed issues of style and paragraphing, then Write 1000 is an ideal follow-up unit for you. If you've been interested by the uh, theories of argument, such as Toulminian or Rogerian argument, then Write 1002, which is an entirely online junior unit, would be a fantastic unit for you. Um, and if you're looking for more, a more advanced approach to argumentation, Write 2002 would be a good unit to follow up with. Um, also keep in mind if you're thinking of how rhetoric and writing uh, are useful in the workplace and you're interested in thinking about how communication at university prepares you for communication in the workplace, um, a new unit of study, Write 3000 Professional Writing, is now available as well. Um, I recommend all of these units to you. I don't teach in all of them, um, but I'm a a big believer in the importance of rhetoric and writing as a core part of the curriculum and all of these units I think would be a great benefit to students in any degree. So here's an overview of what we'll be doing in the lecture today. We're briefly going to look at the unit outcomes, thinking about how the unit has been designed to help you achieve these outcomes and these important attributes. Um, also we'll be thinking of the the main questions about why these outcomes are important and how does doing a rhetorical analysis help you achieve these outcomes. Uh, secondly, we're going to look at some of the rhetorical concepts discussed in the unit. Uh, we'll look particularly at the rhetorical situation, the rhetorical appeals um, and issues to do with cross-cultural communication. Um, you should be using one of these concepts or some of these concepts in your final essay um, and we'll be asking why you would use these concepts and what, what sort of conclusions you can draw from using these concepts in an analysis. Um, speaking of the essay, we're going to cover three of the most common comments that are provided on the final essay and you can think of this as a type of feed forward uh, rather than feedback. Um, so before your essay is due, we're going to give you these three comments in the hope that you can think about them and respond to them um, before you actually submit your essay. And finally, we're going to think about two of the big conclusions that we can take away from this course about um, the, these are the two of the big ideas underpinning the course. How can rhetoric help you understand communication better um, and how to understand audiences better? And also, how can it help you participate in scholarly communities um, in a more informed and purposeful way? So here are the Write 1001 outcomes. There are five of them. And it's worth thinking about now at the, toward the end of the unit, how, have the, how has the unit been designed to help you achieve these objectives and why are they important? Um, we've practiced communication and argumentation, uh, the first two objectives here, across a range of genres. 
Uh, so you've written online in journals, you've communicated in person through in-class presentations, um, and you've submitted written um, tasks in which you're meant to, formal and informal, in which you're meant to uh, display competent communication and produce effective arguments. We've examined different academic writing styles and presentation techniques, uh, both in written and um, in oral form, and reflected on how they do or should engage diverse cultural audiences. So this is objective three and four. We've looked at the different contexts for academic argument um, and how they apply to um, texts that cross cultural borders, including how do we produce effective texts that uh, can communicate to different cultural uh, audiences of different cultural backgrounds. Um, we've also thought about how to edit our own work. Um, so the, the final few lectures of the course and online activities have been about how you edit your own work and, and approaches you take in the editing of other work, uh, other students' work. And the idea here is that you can edit your own work, you've submitted drafts and been given feedback on those drafts, so you're going to have to edit those before you submit your final essay. Um, so you've practiced editing and you've developed a theory of editing as well. Now, the course objectives have been taught in a way that promotes an understanding of um, and use of rhetoric. You can adjust your communication to suit an audience um, or to suit a different situation. And you can analyse the different ways that people attempt to persuade you and convince you of things. This is really important in universities where you're going to be communicating across a range of different disciplines throughout your degree. You might find yourself studying psychology, history, English, uh, sociology, anthropology, any of these disciplines. You might go on to study law or education or business um, after your first degree. And in any of these different disciplines, you'll find different preferences for styles of communication. And the way we've taught you about academic communication is through the lens of rhetoric, um, which is a theory that allows you to adapt um, and change your communication to suit different situations and audiences. So we hope that in addressing these outcomes, we're helping you become a, a better academic communicator. But of course, um, we're also teaching you this so that once you're out in the real world, as they say, um, you'll be able to adjust your communication for generalist audiences or audiences with different uh, interests in the kind of specialist knowledge you've developed here at university and that you'll no doubt develop uh, in the workforce. In some ways, um, this approach hopes to foster what can be called habits of thinking or habits of mind. Um, I said very early in the course that some people argue well by accident and someone some people argue well by habit. And the approaches to writing that we've taught in this course are designed to improve your habits of argumentation so that rather than accidentally hitting a hitting upon the right formula for an argument in a particular situation, you habitually analyse and interpret and design arguments that will uh, be appropriate for different audiences. Um, in all of these ways, I think rhetoric will make you a better student, it'll make you a better employee, and it makes you a better human being, it makes your life better as well as you start to interpret the arguments that surround you in the world and that attempt to influence you and you think about the best and most appropriate ways to influence other people. So the driving force of this unit is the idea of a rhetorical analysis. Everyone in the unit is doing a rhetorical analysis as part of their final essay and so it's really important to take a moment now to think about your final essay and think Am I conducting a rhetorical analysis? For Aristotle, um, the study of rhetoric would help you defend yourself from unfair arguments and also uh, prepare you to uh, de deliver effective and ethical arguments um, to others in your society. That is, the goal of, a, of the study of rhetoric was to be able to identify how other people use rhetoric 
which would help us um, perfect our own uses of rhetoric. So in the long term, the idea of a rhetorical analysis is about uh, preparing you for life in the real world and also for uh, helping you uh, avoid being manipulated and avoid manipulating others. Key to this study of rhetoric and to rhetorical analysis is an understanding of some important concepts um, in the theory of rhetoric, such as the rhetorical situation, uh, the rhetorical appeals and cross-cultural communication. The rhetorical situation has been a core concept in the course, um, right 1001. It endures as a framework to help you decide how to analyse and interpret arguments and how to adjust and alter your own argument. So every single rhetorical concept comes back to the rhetorical situation in the sense that when you're deciding whether or how to use a rhetorical strategy, um, you need to consider the situation in which you're using it in order to make a good decision uh, about the best way to argue or persuade someone. When analysing an act of communication, so tying this into the idea of rhetorical analysis, um, you can use the rhetorical situation to examine the background of a rhetor or an arguer or uh, an author, um, one point of the triangle in the communication triangle. Um, you can examine the rhetor's skills, their background, their experiences and so on, and think about how these factors have influenced the rhetor's stance on a topic. You can examine the audience's beliefs, their values, their knowledge, etc., their expectations. Um, how will the audience, or at least how the rhetor conceives of the audience, affect the uh, design of the text, the um, delivery of the material, the information that's presented, and so on. And you can examine the <clears throat> Sorry, you can examine the text itself, what language has been used, what presentation techniques, what style, what delivery methods have been used, how has the text been arranged, how has it been designed um, to represent the author's view and the audience's expectations and balance those two things. Now, all of this is surrounded by contextual understanding, um, how the location, how the history, how the culture and the background of a rhetor, of an audience, the traditions of a text, all influence the act of communication. So is the act taking place in a university or a professional setting? Are there personal goals for the author um, or professional goals for the author? Is the audience a public audience um, where they'll be influenced by the reactions of those around them? Um, or are they a kind of private audience who's sitting at home reading on a screen by themselves? Um, the understanding of the context will uh, help you understand the audience, the rhetor, and the text itself. In a rhetorical analysis, you can uh, analyse an act of communication, breaking it apart into these different um, elements to look at how uh, the relationship between them has crafted or shaped that act of communication. And you can ask how well, for example, the rhetor has designed the text to uh, respond to the audience's expectations. You might identify how an audience, um, a, a shift in the constitution of an audience has changed the reception of a text or the attitudes toward an author and so on. Um, so thinking about the relationships um, that are integral to the rhetorical situation is a good way to structure a rhetorical analysis based on this concept. In the course, we've spent a lot of time talking about context and culture, um, trying to find a, um, a complex and rich and deep way to understand the context of communication. And one of the key ideas we came across was by Ulla Connor in her work, Intercultural Rhetoric in the Writing Classroom, um, where she looks at how all of us participate in multiple cultures simultaneously. And you can think about how our participation in multiple uh, cultures affects all of the elements of the rhetorical situation. 
So given that authors and audiences are shaped by their culture, an understanding of culture is vital to uh, the study of rhetoric, both in the sense that of analysing rhetoric as other people design it and deliver um, an argument, but also in our own use of rhetoric, um, understanding uh, or conceiving of an audience and how best to respond to them. Um, so viewing individuals as a product of multiple cultures and situations as involving many overlapping cultures enables us to consider the various responsibilities and challenges we have when producing an argument. At times, for example, um, we have an obligation to uh, one aspect of our culture that seems to be in opposition or conflict with another kind of cultural community that we participate in. So how, for example, our responsibility as a professional academic might clash with our responsibilities as a um, social activist. Um, and the idea of rhetoric or, or analysing rhetoric in that kind of situation would be to think about how an author has overcome that conflict or found ways to, um, to enable one goal without um, overruling another. <clears throat> so when you analyse an act of communication, you might find that it was effective or not because of the way the author was, to, was able to respond to their various cultural obligations. We've also looked at the rhetorical appeals and fallacies, um, separating out different aspects of communication into appeals to character, appeals to emotion, appeals to logic, and so on. Um, importantly, in doing this, we have attempted to think about um, how the combination of ethos, pathos, and logos in a text have produced effective, ethical, persuasive, or even educational uh, rhetoric. So as a brief recap, we've got appeals to ethos or character, trustworthiness, fairness, experience, and so on. How does an author appeal to these elements? Um, we have appeals to emotion, fear, hostility, excitement, love, lust, etc. How does an author use these emotions to, um, to convince someone or to push forward their argument? And appeals to logic. How do people use explanation, common sense, wisdom, deduction, induction, and so on um, to, to construct an argument? It's certainly excellent to be able to identify these different appeals in a text, but the goal of a complex rhetorical analysis is to draw a conclusion based on that um, identification. Um, how has the balance of or imbalance of these rhetorical appeals led to a text that is persuasive, manipulative, um, or effective, whatever criteria you use to form a judgment about the text? So there's a question of why uh, we would make you study rhetoric in Write 1001. Essentially, I think our approach to rhetoric and communication in Write 1001 mirrors the purpose of a university. Um, I think good academic writing reflects the, um, the best values of a higher education institution. Um, Andrea Lunsford and Lisa Ede in writing about the distinctions between classical and modern rhetoric, talk about uh, rhetoric in a modern academic sense as, and they're quoting here, or I'm quoting them here, the art of using language in the creation and sharing of knowledge. Um, and it's just a wonderful quote that captures, I think, what we should aim to do in our academic writing. We should aim to create through our writing process and share through the delivery and production of sound arguments, knowledge and information. And this is exactly what a good university does. It promotes the uh, creation and the sharing of information, knowledge um, and ideas. So I think the study of rhetoric is core to a university's purpose and I think it's actually something that prepares you very well um, for life beyond the university as well. So in terms of the final essay, I thought it would be useful now to look at some common uh, comments that we make on the final essay. This course has been taught for several years now 
uh, with a rhetorical analysis as the final essay task. Um, and I do find that we often say similar things to people. These are common challenges for the task and how well you overcome and deal with these challenges can uh, indicate how well you're doing in the course. The three most common comments are one, that you haven't used academic sources or you haven't used enough academic sources in your final essay. Two, your essay doesn't conduct a rhetorical analysis. This is an absolutely fatal flaw. You need to avoid this one at all costs. Um, and three, that you've used rhetorical terms, but you need to connect them to your argument and perform a rhetorical analysis uh, in a more organised and rigorous manner. In terms of this first comment, you, you may have not used academic sources or used enough academic sources. It, the common cause of this comment is a misunderstanding about what is a scholarly source. So a simple formula that we've been using in Write 1001 is to think of a scholarly source as something that is published by academics, for academics, in an academic uh, situation or publication. So a journal or a scholarly publisher. Um, so a blog post by an academic wouldn't count as a scholarly source because it, even though it's published by an academic and the material is academic in nature, it's published for a general audience. Um, likewise, for a newspaper article um, or an article in an open website. However, an article published in a journal uh, that's being distributed to an academic uh, audience um, is a scholarly source. And the key thing here also is in how you use academic sources. So a question here, have you used your sources critically, not just cited them? Um, so what we're looking for is a level of engagement with the academic sources that you use. Have you um, perhaps summarised some sources, but have you gone into a more in-depth engagement with other sources? Have you used a source to define a rhetorical term, but then added to that uh, definition of the rhetorical term or critiqued the definition as missing something or um, being at odds with another definition. So have you used these sources critically? And thirdly, have you used academic sources about rhetoric and about your topic? Um, so a lot of comments in Short Writing Task 4 were aimed at um, encouraging you to find a balance in your research between research into rhetoric and research into the arguments and the topics that you're analysing. Um, and this is typical in studies of rhetoric where you need the specialist language and conceptual knowledge uh, for rhetoric, for studies of rhetoric, but you also need specialist knowledge in a field of study um, or an area aside from rhetoric. So understanding more about the debate through that specialist knowledge so that you can then um, properly understand how and why rhetoric has been used in that situation. Relating to the second common comment, uh, that your essay may not conduct a rhetorical analysis, you could ask yourself these questions. Have you used rhetorical terms and applied them to a debate or topic? Um, in this sense, have you used those terms such as the rhetorical situation, um, rhetorical appeals like ethos, pathos and logos? but importantly, have you applied them to a debate or topic? Um, and the nature of this application um, is a tricky area um, for people writing the final essay for this task. Often uh, there are claims made such as, you know, the author here uses an appeal to pathos, um, but that's not an in-depth uh, convincing application of the terms. What you would need to do from that point is explain the nature of the use of uh, pathos or how exactly the words in the quote by a certain uh, author demonstrate an emotional appeal. Identify what emotion is being appealed to and why. Um, so the application can, can go further in depth than simply claiming that someone uses rhetoric in one way or another. And secondly here about conducting a rhetorical analysis, 
it's very important that uh, you're at, you use these academic sources to help define your definitions of rhetorical terms. As a very old field of study, there are so many definitions of these different rhetorical concepts and ideas. We've covered as many as we could in the last 12 weeks. Um, so one thing that scholars in rhetoric are interested in is how you actually define the terms and where you draw these definitions from. Um, so referring to academic work to help you do that is a great way to um, show that you're participating in the field of rhetoric and composition, but also to be careful and rigorous in designing um, your analysis. For this third point, you used rhetorical terms, but you need to connect your argument to your rhetorical analysis. This really comes down to the nature of your argument. Are you making a clear claim based on your argument? Are the rhetorical terms you use essential to your claim? And is your argument about the rhetoric in the debate you're analysing? Um, so thinking about, you might review the Toulminian argument lecture from um, earlier in the course. Thinking about the claim and the reason, the two essential parts to your argument, reason is something that you've proved, and ideally here you've proved something about rhetoric, so you've proven that someone's rhetoric is more ethical or more effective or more persuasive, and then you make a claim based on that reason or that proof. If your claim is not extending from that understanding of rhetoric in the debate, then you're going to get this third comment that the rhetorical terms um, you've used are not strongly connected to your um, argument or that you've, your argument and your analysis or your method are not strongly connected. Um, so making sure that you have a claim based on your argument, that the rhetorical terms you use are essential to your claim and that your argument is about the rhetoric you're in the debate you're analysing if you're doing all of these things, if you can say yes to each of these parts of the question, um, then you're on track to be producing exactly the kind of argument we want to see in your final essay. So I thought I would just wrap up now with some general conclusions about writing and rhetoric in Write 1001. Hopefully these ideas, um, in addition to making you feel like you've done something wonderful and worthwhile um, by spending yeah, you know, uh, 100 or 150 hours of your life in this unit of study. Um, in addition to that, this conclusion should uh, help you think about the broader significance of the essay uh, that you're writing and perhaps lead to some good thoughts for your the conclusion of your essay um, or help you refine the claim of your argument um, so that it's responding to some of the big ideas in rhetoric and composition. Firstly, um, one of the key ideas is that writing is a process, not a product. So what we've encouraged in this unit is an approach to writing and communication um, that is not about the final words on the page or the final words in an argument. It's about a process through which you can understand what other people have said in a debate, what you might say in a debate, and what are the most effective and ethical ways to present an argument. Um, we can go back to this very ancient definition of rhetoric um, by Aristotle that its function is not to persuade but to see the available means of persuasion in each case. Um, in a rhetorical analysis, it's about identifying how other people have sought to persuade someone of an idea. Um, you're showing us through your rhetorical analysis that you're able to see the available means of persuasion. And importantly, it's about us being ethical communicators um, and deciding the best strategies to use for ourselves. So not only are you identifying how other people use rhetoric, you're coming to some kind of conclusion about um, the quality or the nature of their uses of rhetoric. Are they ethical? Are they unethical? Are they effective or ineffective? And so on. And another key idea in the study of rhetoric is this idea of ethical rhetoric. I think there's a really um, key quote in one of the readings by Inch and Warnick where they tell us, they give us a definition of unethical rhetoric um, by which we can start to understand what ethical rhetoric would be. Uh, Inch and Warnick say, arguers who act to undermine their audiences 
or weaken community bonds and structures are generally considered unethical. I think that's a key quote. Um, it can help us understand that ethical rhetoric would involve people strengthening their audiences and strengthening community bonds and structures. Uh, ethical rhetoric would be about informing and encouraging and promoting um, an audience's ability to engage with an issue. Ethical rhetoric would be about encouraging communities to act in responsible and cohesive ways. Um, so we can use this criteria to better understand um, what to do once we've understood uh, the different means of persuasion on an issue. Uh, rhetoric is a very powerful tool. You can convince and manipulate people, but if we're committed to the ideals of ethical communication, then what we'll actually be doing is improving our communities, improving ourselves, um, and giving people the opportunity to make informed, strong, um, cohesive decisions. So not only is a rhetorical analysis about um, demonstrating the skills of the study of rhetoric, it's about allowing you the opportunity to think about the ideal ways to behave as a member of society um, and how your communication reflects the different values and commitments that you have. Um, so with that, I'd just like to say um, good luck with your future studies and, uh, and your professional lives that no doubt will follow. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you in Write 1001 and I hope you've learnt as much from the material here as I have learnt um, teaching it to you and that it's something that uh, will not only improve your writing in the immediate sense but something that will give you more pleasure in your general lives and uh, a more organised, ethical and effective approach to writing in the workplace and the wider world.